All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you again for joining us for Don't Wing It, Plan It, Make Your Yard Bird Friendly. Uh, our presenter today is Aaron Hoffer from our seed uh, department in uh, the city of Plano. And uh, a brief introduction for her, when asked what she does for a living, Aaron Hoffer quips that she gets paid to play in the dirt with worms and to encourage others to do the same as often as possible. She is delighted to combine her love of gardening and her love of education into a full-time vocation as an environmental educator and a part-time uh, advocation as a master gardener and master com composter volunteer. So I'm gonna pass off our presentation to Erin and um, we'll have some fun learning. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for inviting me this morning. Um, today, we are going to talk about um, making our yards a little more friendly for our bird friends. So uh, I would love to know, why do you love birds? I think there's like a question or a chat box. Go ahead and uh, type in there the uh, reasons that you love birds. Meredith, why do you love birds? Um, they, they just have such amazing personalities, uh, watching them interact and hop around and uh, their songs, love them. Yep. Nikki, why do you love birds? I love how many different kinds of birds there are and just observing them and how different they all act as well as like different colorings, patterns, markings. I think it's all really yeah, fun. Yeah, aren't they, aren't they a beautiful addition to the landscape? Well, some folks love birds for their musical voices. And I have to say the call of the morning dove is so distinctive. That's probably one of the very first calls I learned as a child. Um, because it has that sort of haunting uh, melodic quality to it. Uh, I love birds because of their, they are harbingers of spring. Uh, I know when I see uh, uh, a robin, spring is, if it's not here, it's just around the corner. Uh, I love birds, especially uh, funny birds like uh, blue jays for their antics. Sometimes it's just really fun to sit and watch them. Uh, one of the birds that I can remember in Oklahoma as a child was the mockingbird. Uh, they can mimic up to 200 different bird songs uh, during their lifetime. So they are pretty impressive for their ability to make uh, the sounds of other birds. And then, as you mentioned, sometimes it's just that gorgeous color. And uh, one of my favorite birds when I was a child was a cardinal, because when you're a little kid, uh, red, that just pops out in the landscape, doesn't matter what time of year it is, you can always find a male cardinal uh, very, very easily. But I, what I really wanna talk to you all about today is that if you love birds, then care for them and don't wait to start showing your love and care for the birds. Unfortunately, bird populations are in decline uh, and, and one in four birds has disappeared in the last 50 some odd years, which is a really sad statistic. And some birds are more vulnerable than others. Um, there's about two and a half billion migratory birds that we have lost in the last 50 years. And for example, uh, 40 percent, two in five uh, uh, Baltimore Orioles have been lost. And the people say, well, why are we losing these birds? And it's because their habitats are disappearing. Uh, and humans are part of that reason. Along that migratory path, we're replacing wildlife habitat with our own habitat, or at least the, we're all in the same habitat, but we're adapting that habitat to meet our needs. And we're removing things that were meeting the needs of our nature friends. So we do have the opportunity to replace some of that habitat in our landscapes, but often we don't do it. Sometimes we don't do it because we're ignorant of the need for doing that. Sometimes we're aware that we need to do it, but we're ignorant of, well, what, what plans do I use? So I'm hopeful that as we're talking today, you will get some ideas of what you can do to help. You can help by making bird-friendly choices in your landscape, 
but you can also do it in your lifestyle. You don't have to be a gardener or a landscape designer to make those changes that help birds. You just need a kind heart and a willingness to adapt some new habits. Um, one thing that we can change is our perspective. And it's, we need to think about the fact that our songbirds spend spring and summer with us in North America, but they migrate and they spend the winter months much further south. And that is a big circle. It's all connected. The choices that we make here in North America affect their ability to go south, the choices that folks farther south make have an impact on the bird's ability to migrate back north to us later in the year. So looking at the migratory patterns, you can see um, on the far left hand side of the map, a green line. And you can see that there are some birds that spend part of the year up in Alaska, but then they migrate all the way south down to Patagonia, down to the base part of Argentina and into Chile. In order to do that, they've got to have energy. In order to do that, they have to have fat that they can store for a long migration. Well, that means they've got to have a high quality habitat to allow them to accumulate that fat. So here is an example of a high quality habitat farther south. Uh, this is a shade coffee plantation. Uh, shade coffee plantations provide good foraging habitat for both the migratory birds that visit us and the resident birds that stay uh, in the area. Those uh, habitats provide insects. It's, it's a place that insects live. It's a habitat for the insects. The insects are food for our birds, but those uh, plants also provide fruit. They can provide nectar. All of the things that birds need to build body fat that allows them to travel long migration distances. Unfortunately, uh, shade plantations have started to go away over the last couple of decades and they are being replaced by sun-grown coffee plantations. Uh, and those changes in the farming practices have had a profound impact on the bird population. Uh, coffee plants in the sun mature faster. That means they have a higher yield and the farmer can get um, the money more quickly. Unfortunately, it is also a poor quality coffee. And when the farmers take away those trees, well, they also take away the, the ecological services that the trees provide. Things like um, preventing erosion and landslides because the roots of the trees keep the soil in place. Uh, it prevents, um, uh, it removes the protecting of the water quality. Uh, the nutrients that the trees add to uh, the farms. The trees store carbon. The trees provide habitat for birds and other species. And you're thinking, okay, fine, but why does it matter? Why we don't grow coffee in Texas, I can't, change a, I don't have a coffee plantation, I can't change that. Um, but what I can change is the kind of coffee that I buy. That means that I'm going to look for shade grown coffee. Uh, shade grown coffee is delicious. It's certainly, uh, it's the Arabica bean. Uh, it's economically beneficial to farmers and because it allows the habitat to stay in place, it can help more than 42 species of North American songbirds. So when I'm making choices at the grocery store, I look for shade grown coffees. Are they more expensive? Yeah, sometimes they're a little more expensive, but that's a personal choice that I make as a consumer because I want to show that yes, these kind of coffees I will buy, I will pay a little bit more money and um, I know that in doing so, I am helping to provide habitat for those birds that come into my backyard, even though the coffee is thousands and thousands of miles away. Another choice that I can make in my yard is to reduce the amount of lawn that is there and to choose to replace it with native plants. What a lot of people don't realize is that there are 63 million acres of lawn. And that's a huge potential for supporting wildlife. Now, lawn does have its place. 
It is cooler. Um, it helps uh, to absorb some of the heat. That's especially important here in Texas, but it doesn't support wildlife, uh, particularly the way that native plants do. So one of the resources that I encourage people to explore is the Audubon uh, Society's website. If you go to audubon.org and you put in native plants, they have um, native plant lists and they will tell you which uh, birds those plants attract. So there is a great resource out there because of course the Audubon Society wants you to help uh, support the birds that they think are so incredibly valuable. A common uh, comment that I get is, yeah, but I don't have a very big yard or I live in an apartment. I don't have a yard. What I want you to know is that every little space helps. So even if you're just planting a small container garden or you're creating just a small plot of uh, bird friendly plants in the corner of your yard, you are helping birds year round. Uh, one of the most important things is that you are attracting insects. Uh, think of it, a lot of folks are interested in pollinator gardens. They want to help the pollinators. Well, many of our pollinators are also food for our birds. Or if the insect itself is not food, then the larva, its babies, are in, uh, full of protein and they are the, uh, they are the source of food. Another thing is in selecting plants that you can select plants that have seeds over several seasons or provide nectar to birds like hummingbirds. So all of those little um, pieces add up and it does not have to be a big garden. A really good example of uh, providing seeds is uh, uh, coneflowers. So goldfinches love seeds like coneflowers. Here is one of our friends I know out in our garden because it was so hot this summer. Uh, our cone flowers, instead of uh, blooming into the fall like normal, they've already gone to seed. So we already know the kind of crop that's going to be provided for our bird friends throughout the winter. A lot of folks love to feed the flock. Keep in mind that every plant in your yard is a bird feeder. It either has food or it doesn't have food. And if you want to feed all of your bird friends, this is not the way to do it. Believe it or not, wild birds actually like to forage for their food. Um, they want, to, it helps keep their brain as active. They like the exploration, it, you know, they move around and having it all in one place is not necessarily the best way to help them. Another thing that happens, it's a very common complaint that I hear about is, Oh, I love feeding the birds, but how do I keep the vermin out of it? Uh, birds are picky. Birds will reach in, grab a nut. If it's a nut that they like or a seed that they like, they will eat it. If it's one that they don't consider high quality or tasty, they will throw it on the ground below the bird feeder. And that is what attracts the squirrels and the mice and the voles and the other nature creatures that are furry and have tails and are running around on the ground. And that is what creates problems. And I know people that have quit feeding with a bird feeder just from that frustration. So the recommendation is skip these. Um, and we actually do put a small amount out during the winter time when there's not a lot of plants that are available. Although I have to say in our uh, front garden, we have lots and lots of plants that have seeds in them. So we do actually have a pretty good amount, but we do a little bit of supplemental feeding, but it's only in the winter time. The rest of the year, the birds forage from what we have put uh, out in terms of plants. So native plants, native food. Um, and one of the things uh, here, you've got goldfinches that love sunflowers. You are not the only ones that think that they are a tasty snack. So those native plants provide a habitat for the insects, but they also can provide seeds. And those two have grown up together. They have evolved together. There's a, they have a symbiotic relationship together. Uh, birds can help pollinate. Birds can help spread seed by eating the seed and dropping the seed or eating the berry and dropping the seed inside of the berry outside someplace else so that that can create a new plant. Uh, this lovely uh, little chickadee with the uh, larva that it has, um, 
chickadees love the uh, larvae. They are great protein for them. They are great protein for their babies. But an interesting thing is that a chickadee population can only sustain their population if at least 70% of the plants are native plants in that habitat. And there are birds that require a higher percentage. So as we have removed those plants that are natives and replace them with non-native plants or replace them with lawn, um, we, have, we have contributed to the problem uh, that our birds are having with foraging. So what kind of plants are perfect for a bird buffet? So let me think. Um, we've got some of the ones out in our garden, plants that are pollinator attractors. Um, here we've got a Henry Duelberg salvia and an eastern black swallowtail that is looking for the nectar. We hope that the butterfly is uh, dropping her um, eggs somewhere nearby since she is uh, uh, feeding here. We hope that our plants will uh, be uh, attractive to her so that she can uh, have those larvae hatch out. As soon as those larvae hatch out, they can become food for our birds. Sometimes the butterflies themselves become uh, food for the birds. And I know that's kind of, so, some people are like, no, no, but that's kind of how nature works. That's part of the food chain or the food pyramid. I am sad to report, if you had not already heard, that monarchs earlier this summer were placed on the endangered species list. And a lot of that has to do with us having um, lost or, or taken away the habitat that had the milkweed in them. While there are lots of nectar plants that the adults can use to feed themselves, the female uh, monarchs will only lay their um, uh, eggs on a milkweed plant. And as we have taken away the milkweed, then there's no place for them to lay their babies. The reason it matters is because when the eggs hatch out, those caterpillars only eat milkweed. That is their only source of food, those leaves. So as those have gone away, uh, we have reduced the populations. So by putting out uh, lots of plants that are nectar bearing, uh, we do sustain the adult but it's only by putting out milkweed that we attract the mothers to lay their eggs and for the eggs to be sustained, hatched out and uh, replenish the population. So if you are thinking about putting things out, definitely put a cluster of milkweed. There are four milkweeds that do well here. Uh, we just planted a couple uh, last week. We went out and got some uh, more uh, and we are hoping to have a good established patch of milkweed that will be very easy for the monarch mamas to see and come and lay uh, their eggs on. In addition to uh, sunflowers, uh, other plants that provide seeds and essential fat and protein uh, are things like uh, black-eyed Susans. And I love black-eyed Susans, they're just so cheerful. And when they get to the end of the season, all of their uh, yellow petals are going to drop off, but there will still be those clusters in the middle, those dark, the eye part, and those will be wonderful all through the winter for our bird friends. Another one that I just absolutely love that I think is so terribly pretty, is the Coreopsis. And there are so many different types of Coreopsis. Um, I forgot to note which Coreopsis this is. What's great about it is that it's super easy to grow. It comes in lots and lots of different colors, several different forms. There's a, uh, one called tall Coreopsis, which I think is Coreopsis lanceolata. And uh, it, it, you may also notice tick seed. And after it goes uh, dormant and it drops its leaves and it drops its uh, petals, all of those little buds in the middle will have seeds for our bird friends. And then of course, in the, uh, we also have the Autumn Sedum Joy. We just put some of those out. We had some in our garden and they unfortunately uh, got uh, um, surrounded by the nearby uh, Turk's cat and it just choked out all the light and eventually they died. So we got some new ones and we put them in an area way far away from the Turk's cap, which is an excellent plant for birds. Um, but these Autumn Seed and Joy, this is the original one. Uh, you may know it by stone crop is another name. 
The, this is sort of a pink color. They have them also in burgundy. They have some white ones. Uh, check to make sure that it's the original though, not a hybrid, because sometimes the hybrids are sterile and they won't produce the seeds. And you go, how do I know? You got to go look it up. Uh, and, the, and we uh, in the garden are still learning uh, plant by plant who helps which birds who don't help birds at all that maybe help other pollinators. And of course, don't forget marigolds. We're in the middle of uh, the autumn and marigolds are fabulous. Uh, they're, they're just so cheerful. But again, get the original marigold. Uh, don't get one of the hybrids. Uh, sometimes they're bigger, they're prettier, but they don't produce the seed. Uh, marigolds are definitely enjoyed by birds. Some of them just crack the hard seeds after they form, but some of them, uh, the birds will just actually rip into the flower and pull out the petals to get at the seed. So don't be surprised if you get a really good crop of uh, marigolds out there. If you see some of the uh, birds out there kind of destroying your floral display because they are looking for food and marigolds definitely provide it. Another plant that we absolutely love and we have it in the garden is the American Beauty Berry uh, because it, it's a plant with fruit and it has juicy seeds for robins and cardinals, mockingbirds, and finches. Uh, I will warn you, however, it will also feed squirrels and raccoons and foxes and field mice. And if you've got deer, then they're going to feed the deer. It is a deciduous plant, so that means that it's going to drop its leaves in uh, at the end of the season, and all you will have are those long uh, dried out branches with the fruit on them for uh, all of the winter or as long as they last before all of our um, nature friends come and eat them. One of the reasons that I do recommend this as a, as a plant, aside from the fact that it is wonderful for our, for our woodland uh, nature friends, is that it is one that is highly adapted to different sunlight conditions. It will grow in full sun, but it will also grow in full shade. Uh, in full shade, you probably won't get as many berries, but we have had it in full shade. I won't say deep shade, because in that case, there's no, no light at all in that area, but we do get some um, reflected light into our uh, sh full shade area. And it they are, right now that we can already see the fruits forming and coming out and they're doing just fine. Another one uh, that is an evergreen is a yopon holly, but you have to make sure that you got the female yopon holly. Um, the yopon holly that's the female puts out the berries and it will attract like bluebirds, uh, mockingbirds, robins, and uh, even cedar wax wings will come to it. It always is green. Uh, yes, it does have a uh, sort of thorns along the side of it that doesn't seem to bother the birds. And since you're probably not pruning, except maybe at the base of the plant, uh, they're probably not going to bother you either. But it's a great plant for uh, fruit. Another fruiting plant that we have in our demonstration garden, and I definitely invite you all to come by the Environmental Education Center and have a look. Um, I will tell you the summer was pretty rough on our landscape kind of like it probably was on yours. Uh, the fruit, however, uh, lasted pretty much throughout most of the summer, and this is a leather leaf mahonia. Uh, it's one of the very first plants to flower in the spring, usually around the beginning of February, and it has this um, huge yellow, golden yellow blossom, and then eventually it becomes uh, this fruit. Uh, some folks call it uh, grape holly, Oregon holly, once upon a time, our ancestors um, would gather these and they would put them into jams. Um, we, however, leave them for the birds. They're not really, they look like grapes, but they're not really very grapey and they, they have a, a very bitter taste apparently. But the birds love them. And I will say we get tons of mockingbirds uh, sitting on our leather leaf mahonias, especially during the summertime. It's nice and juicy and it's full of lots of sugar. Speaking of sugar and nectar, here are uh, some plants that hummingbirds absolutely adore. Most people I think know that hummingbirds are attracted to uh, plants that have red blossoms. So a typical one here in North Central Texas is going to be the uh, red yucca. But I wanted you to know that something as simple as a dahlia 
can also attract a hummingbird. Uh, another native plant that is uh, pretty common here that is a hummingbird feeder is a Turk's cap. And I always wondered how they got uh, into that little Turk's cap because it's, it appears to be a fairly tight blossom, but apparently they do not have any trouble at all getting their little beaks and their extremely long tongues down inside. And I thought this was a marvelous picture of a hummingbird um, busy gathering up that nectar. And even zinnias, uh, I kind of classify dahlias and zinnias as um, old fashioned flowers, I think is a good way of putting it. And uh, here you've got zinnias, uh, they are flat. It's very easy for a hummingbird to get at the nectar, but it's also very easy for our pollinators like uh, bees and butterflies to enjoy it. Butterflies love uh, a lot of the plants that have flowers that are flat and open or what we call platform shaped. So again, if you don't have room for a large plant like a red yucca, you can plant some of these old fashions like zinnias and dahlias uh, to provide food for your uh, bird friends. I wanna take a moment and talk about water because water, right after food, water is extremely important to birds. Uh, but as humans, we don't really look at it from the bird perspective. So you'll notice that this bird bath is shallow and wide. That is really important. Um, a lot of times we think, oh, I'll put out a lot of water and then I don't have to mess with it for a couple of days or maybe even a whole week and there'll be plenty of water for the birds. The problem is, is that what birds really need is something that mimics a puddle because in nature, that's their bird bath. So think wide like a puddle and shallow like a puddle. Like an inch of water is plenty of water for a bird bath. Also, when you're looking at a bird bath, you want something that has a rough surface, something that has a sure footing while they're splashing in the water. I know that there are bird baths out there that are beautiful and they're made out of blown glass and everybody thinks that they um, contribute to the beauty of the garden, which they absolutely do, but they're not a good idea for a bird bath. Uh, because it, they're, they're just too slick. A bird will land and go, mm, nope, I'm going to slip on this one. I am not going to even try to take a bath. Now, if you have one of those, you can adapt it by putting small pebbles in the bottom of it and reducing the amount of water that's there just enough to splash around. Uh, birds will um, at least try to have a bath in it. But if you don't have a bath and you're getting ready to buy one, look for one that is shallow and wide and has a rough surface on the bottom. The other thing about bird baths is changing the water. When I was a small child and I was uh, visiting my grandparents in the summertime, one of my chores, and I was probably about four at the time, was to go out and ch uh, with my grandmother or my grandfather and tend to the garden and change the water in the uh, bird bath. Now, of course, as a kid with a hose, I thought that was like the most fun chore ever. Sometimes crabs don't wanna do that because it's like too much trouble, but honestly, it really isn't that much trouble to go and tip out the old water and put new water in. From a bird perspective, birds like clean water. They wanna clean themselves of dust and dirt and mites, but they're not the only bird that's coming there. So think about it from your perspective. Do you want, if there was a bathtub of water and all the neighbors came and bathed in it and it only got changed once a week, would you want to bathe in that water or drink it? Yeah, well, the birds don't want to either. So changing the water at least every other day means that they have fresh water to drink, fresh water to bathe in, and you don't have to worry about mosquitoes. All right, up to this point, um, do we have any questions, Nikki? I'm not seeing any in the chat, but I'm not seeing the whole chat window either. No, I don't see any in the chat and we don't have any in the Q&A either. Okay, super, thank you so much. So what else can you do? Because we've talked about plants, we've talked about water, 
and making sure that we know exactly uh, what is needed. So let's talk about some lifestyle changes. I know there are lots of cat lovers. My husband is one of them. He absolutely adores cats, uh, but we don't have one because I am allergic to them. But when we lived overseas, his aunt had a cat and it was an indoor cat. Quite honestly, keeping your cat indoors is healthier for the cat. They live longer and healthier lives. Outdoor cats actually kill more birds than any other non-native threat to birds. Um, so if you have the option, keep your cat indoors. It's much healthier for the birds. But if you do have an outdoor cat, my, my mother certainly had a cat that decided uh, in the neighborhood that decided to adopt our family. Um, and it was not interested in coming in the house. It was an outdoor cat. Um, at least make your cat highly visible. Now, there are some folks that say put a bell on a cat. That is a very bad idea. That is, uh, cats have very sensitive ears. And would you want to walk around all day long with a cowbell around you every time that you moved? Cats don't want that either, and it's not fair to them. If they're outside, though, and you love your bird friends, then make them visible, those cats visible to your bird friends. There is something called a be safe collar. You can uh, purchase it online. Think of it as a really uh, wide, flat scrunchie. It's very soft. It goes around the cat's neck. It doesn't hurt them. Uh, it has high contrast patterns. And because that's a moving pattern, it catches the bird's attention and alerts the birds to the fact that there is possibly a predator in the area and allows the birds to keep their distance. Uh, there's even patterns online so that you can, uh, if you, if you sew, you can uh, create your own. Another thing you can do is skip the spray in the garden. Um, sprays can remove the garden pests that may be bugging you all season, but those same bugs, as I mentioned earlier, are food sources for the birds. Um, sometimes when you spray, you may be killing also the good guys that are helping to keep your um, the, the balance of nature in your garden in balance. A good example is ladybugs. Uh, there's actually a children's story available in the library. I believe it's called What About Ladybugs? And it's the uh, woeful tale of a gardener who found a bug he didn't like. And so he started spraying his garden and uh, the ladybugs went away. And when the ladybugs went away, it was like a domino effect and pretty soon the garden was no longer flourishing. And it was the um, uh, tale of the wrong choice that created the wrong results. So skipping the sprays um, may mean that you have more uh, bugs in the garden, but there are other ways to deal with bugs in the garden that are not welcome rather than spraying them. So by skipping those sprays, you allow those insects that are good for the birds and our food sources for the birds to remain there. Another place that you can skip the sprays is in your garden basket or your grocery store basket. Look for organic food choices um, and be part of cutting out some of the 1 billion pounds of pesticides that are used in the U.S. each year. When we make the choice as a consumer to purchase organic food, which sometimes can be a little more expensive, um, we are choosing things that have not been sprayed and we are sending the message that we are willing to purchase those and it encourages more farmers to adapt or adopt um, organic uh, gardening methods. And that means then that more insects are going to be around and there will be more food for the birds. Karen, yes. real Do quickly, you... we did have a question and I'm sorry, I think this came up a couple slides ago. Sure. Um, but a question from Andrea that um, says, where is the demonstration garden? The demonstration garden is at 4116 West Plano Parkway. It is um, on that weird little part of Plano Parkway that runs north and south for about a quarter of a mile. We're about a block north of the animals uh, shelter. We are directly across from a U-Haul and a David McDavid uh, Acura Center. 
Uh, we're just a little bit south of that weird place where 15th Street runs into Plano Parkway. Uh, but 4116 West Plano Parkway is where our demonstration garden is. It is open uh, 365 days a year, sunrise to sunset. The south side of the building or the entrance area, that is what we call the front yard. Uh, that is, uh, we've set it up as a no mow zone. It is a way that you can have, um, uh, it's to show homeowners you can have a beautiful yard that requires very little water, very little maintenance, is very eco-friendly, and you don't have to mow anything. The children's garden is on the north side, and then on the west side, uh, there is a creek, and so we have a creek walk where you can go out and observe um, all of our nature friends that are in the riparian area. So it's a wonderful place to come to, like I said, 365 days a year, sunrise to sunset, we are open. Uh, there's a lovely building there. The restrooms are usually open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, and I think also on Saturdays, but I'm not 100% sure about that. And uh, the building can even be rented for uh, meetings. Um, we just had a wedding, we had a Boy Scout thing this last weekend. So it's a, it's a lovely place just to come bring your lunch. Uh, we definitely uh, encourage the employees that are in the area on our campus uh, to come and just enjoy the shade trees. We even have picnic benches. So yeah, come on. Uh, it's a it's a really, really beautiful place to go hang out. I hope that answers it. It was kind of long, but I wanted to give a pitch for yes, definitely come and visit us. So speaking of uh, plants and trees, let your trees litter. I know sometimes we we have an aesthetic sense where we think we should rake everything up and make it look neat and tidy in our yard, or maybe we have an HOA that says we have to do that. But honestly, don't rake the leaves under the trees. First of all, they are home to insects that the birds love. Plus, they are a blanket that helps to keep water in place around tree roots. Um, I always say that they act as a parasol uh, or a shade covering in the uh, summertime when it's really hot. And they offer, they act as a blanket in the wintertime uh, when it is really cold. So all of that to protect the roots. Plus, as they slowly break down, they are an excellent source of nutrition for the tree. So they kind of become a uh, breakfast in the spring. So if you can help it, please just let your trees litter and provide a home to the insects that the birds are gonna love and that the trees will thank you for helping them as well. Uh, we are in the middle of bird migration system, uh, uh, season, sorry, bird migration season. And when we leave our lights on at night, that can be confusing to birds. Uh, they navigate um, in a couple of different ways. But if leaving your lights on and your curtains uh, open is a problem. So lights out, curtains closed, and turning off any unneeded lights in an area, if you do have to, maybe you're waiting for your kids to come home and you're sort of checking the driveway, then just turn the lights off that you don't need so that the migrating birds don't get confused. Similarly, um, when we are uh, doing our landscape outside, there is a trend and has been a trend for the last couple of decades to uh, put safety lights outside so that you um, can safely walk, you can monitor who's on your property, but we have a tendency for them to be upward into the trees, uh, highlighting maybe the shapes of the trees for their, their beauty, maybe the shrubs, also the shape of the home. The problem is, is that when we take those lights and we tip them upward, it becomes confusing to the birds. It, it interferes with their ability to navigate at night. And a lot of their navigation does occur at night. Uh, that's a time when it's very safe. So when choosing lighting, or if you have existing lighting that is um, adjustable, direct that light downward. You can still have safety lighting, but it's safety lighting that is safe for you as well as safe for the migrating birds. Another um, 
piece is making your window safer. Something like this, this building that is glass, I'm sure is an architectural marvel. A lot of people think it's absolutely gorgeous, but as you can see from this perspective, it reflects the sky and a bird flying is going to be a bird flying directly into what they perceive as more sky. We have over a million bird strikes every year. And as a result, we have a lot of birds that don't recover from those strikes. So we can make our windows on our home safer by making some simple adjustments. Um, you can, of course, close your drapes and your blinds. Um, you can cover the glass inside or outside. Uh, there are inexpensive and easily removable materials that you can put. You can even take those uh, glass marker pens and create designs on your window during a bird migration season, which started uh, kind of in August and will run about for our area. Most of it will be done by about mid-November. And then you can wash it off. Um, if I uh, had younger kids at home, that would be something I would, hey, here, mark it up for the birds. Now, one of the uh, things you can also buy is removable decals. But we had uh, an event where we made them out of dried glue. So we put glue out. We cut patterns. You can see this was a very rough cut. And then we took uh, permanent markers and we um, colored them. Now, a single one on a window, and this was a pretty good sized window, will not help. If you're going to put them up, you need to have them no farther than two inches apart. So creating kind of a grid or a pattern so that each um, marker or um, decal, I guess is the right word, is no farther than two inches from another one. And the reason being is that that two inch area is um, small enough that even a small bird like a sparrow won't attempt to fly through it. They will navigate around it and find a different place to go. There are also, if you, if you look for, uh, Google the term, make uh, bird safe windows, you will find that there are uh, uh, things that you can place on the inside and the outside of, uh, in addition to decals that are long strings that are uh, uh, less than two inches apart. And it's almost like a grid that you can attach on the outside or the inside. It still allows you to look out, but the birds will see those vertical and those horizontal lines and they will avoid the window. And again, it's temporary. If, if you don't like the look of it, although I will say that they're really, you can see out the window pretty easily. If you don't like the look of it, it's just temporary during the migration season in the fall and the migration season in the spring. Another thing that you can do is to be a, a citizen scientist. Bird watchers are one of science's most vital resources um, and the sources of data on how the ecological world is uh, faring. So there is something that is held every year called the annual backyard bird count and it's usually held in February and you can sign up for it now put it on your calendar. And it's usually about the third weekend in February, like the 18th, 19th, 20th, something like that. It's usually uh, three days. And then you log back in and you report the birds that you saw and the time of day that you saw them and where, that you, where you are that they saw them. And the scientists use that information to help track bird populations. Um, they also have something called Global Big Day, uh, that is put on, uh, even though it says ebird.org, that is still part of the Audubon Society. Uh, it's a big annual celebration of birds. No matter where you are, you can join it. They had one just this past May, but they have another one coming up. So those of you who love birds and who love being, uh, or would love to do a deep dive into the scientists, mark your calendar for this October 8th. It's a single day, whereas the bird count is a couple of days. Um, you log in to ebird.org October Big Day, and it will uh, bring up all the information about how to participate and how to help scientists across the United States track all of the, uh, the birds. Some of them are resident birds, but some of them are migrational birds. And that helps us to know um, things like, oh, 20, you know, 40% of our Orioles have disappeared. Uh, or yay, the, the population of uh, mockingbirds is going back up again, or whatever it is. 
Another thing you can do is share what you know. You have friends. Your friends may have missed this. Um, the library is recording it. There'll be uh, a link to it. Share it with your friends. Tell them what you learned today. Tell your coworkers if, uh, and, and spread the word about the very simple choices that they can make in their lifestyle to uh, help support birds. So I want to share with you some resources that can help you help your fine feathered friends. So I did mention earlier the um, uh, birds, uh, uh, the Audubon Society, but Cornell does a lot of um, research in birds. And so as a result, they have a very robust website and I love that you can go there. It has, um, it has recordings of what bird songs are, so does the Audubon Society. It has all kinds of resources to help you learn more about birds, what birds need, how to identify birds. So definitely check out birds.cornell.edu. And then I did mention the Audubon Society. They even have apps that you can download to help you identify uh, the birds. So audubon.org is an excellent a uh, place to get those resources. If you really are committed, um, they also, because they're a 501c3, you can join and you can um, uh, become a member of the Audubon Society and the money that they receive goes to supporting birds and supporting research about birds. Earlier, I mentioned the Shade Coffee. Um, Smithsonian National Zoo and the Conservation Biology Institute has a great website that you can uh, find out where can I buy bird friendly coffee. And this I even pulled two years ago and there have been uh, updates since then. So even your cup of coffee in the morning uh, is a choice to help and support birds. And then the Xerces Society. Uh, this is actually a, a um, website about pollinators and they have a uh, downloadable guide. So you can see this is the one for the South Central region and right there at the bottom of the uh, map is us uh, in uh, our part of Texas and you can download and uh, that uh, PDF and it'll tell you uh, plants that you can plant that are friendly to pollinators, but also birds. Birds are considered pollinators. So you, that is will help guide you in choosing plants that are appropriate for our area, support pollinators, and in particular will support birds. And then there is the Facebook. Live Green and Plano has a Facebook page. We actually have a seven part series on getting started with bird watching that we actually made during the pandemic. Uh, because we had extra time that we, we weren't going out and doing big uh, 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 public events and we weren't going into schools and organizations. So we redirected our time to making videos. And um, it's both about how to start getting uh, started with bird watching, but also how to make your home more bird friendly, in particular your landscape. So we talked about water and choosing plants and uh, all kinds of things. So if you go to our Facebook page, it will redirect you to uh, when you can find them there, but you uh, can also watch them on YouTube. And I believe they are searchable now. So if you put in Live Green and Plano and All About Birds, it should pop up on YouTube. Uh, so that is a huge amount of information. And if you are the least bit interested in birds, you have questions, you want to know more, you can contact us in the Sustainability and Environmental Education Division. That is S-E-E-D, like plant a seed, at Plano.gov. We are part of the Environmental Health and Sustainability Department. We are super happy to answer questions about plants, about birds, or just about living green in general. So that's my pitch for the day. Do we have any questions that are hanging out there, Nikki? I don't see any currently in the Q&A or in the chat. In the chat, great. Well, um, I hope that if you enjoyed this, that you will come back. We do have some um, presentations that are coming up from 
Uh, other folks, I know Katie's going to be here, I think, at the end of the month talking about water conservation. We have folks that are going to talk about um, our National Wildlife Federation certification program. Uh, the city is trying to get registered gardens that are friendly to wildlife, including our bird friends and our butterfly and insect and pollinator friends. And it's super easy to get your yard uh, certified as uh, uh, having uh, being a wildlife habitat. So Olivia's going to come and talk about that, I think, in October or November. So check back with the libraries because we've got uh, three more um, presentations that are coming up. And I think that you will, if you found this one interesting, you will definitely find those interesting and helpful. Uh, I love that you are here today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Nikki. I really appreciate it. So Erin, uh, I have uh, my own question for you. Uh, I've gotten started on Halloween decorating. Do you have any recommendations on what to, to pick that might be either bird friendly or at least not uh, bird detrimental? <laughs> okay, so um, I will tell you that um, first and foremost, get real pumpkins and take those seeds out and you know that you can dry them and eat them, but it, why not put them out for your bird friends instead? Also, um, if you put your pumpkin out, uh, like I know some people like to leave it on the porch. We do have um, usually, and I'm pretty sure they're gonna do it again this year, um, a place where you can do pumpkin drop off. So a lot of folks will leave it till their pumpkin is kind of decomposing and cover, uh, caving in on itself. But we usually uh, pick them up. There's usually a drop-off site and uh, Texas Pure uh, takes them away and composts them. But I say, um, if you're, especially if you've got kids and they can, um, my, my pitch to the kids would be, I know, sweetie, we would love to leave it on the porch for a couple of weeks and watch it decompose. But this year, let's cut it up in chunks and put it out on trays for our bird friends. So picking real pumpkins and using that, because in nature, that's really what would happen. It would, um, if you didn't pick it, it would start to uh, break down and all of our nature friends would come and gather whatever they wanted. So that would be one thing uh, that I would definitely do. If you are looking at uh, things that are like uh, stalks, uh, try to pick the ones that have the seeds on the end because uh, the birds will come, they will, they will eventually see the seeds. And once you're done with the decorating, put them out, make them easier, put them, you know, lean them up against a tree, make them where it, the birds are more likely because they may go, oh, I don't think I want to go on the porch. I saw some humans over there. But if you put them out in nature when you're done with them, uh, let the birds be the ones to uh, pick the seeds off of them. Uh, those are the ones that immediately come to mind, but that is a great question. Um, I will do some thinking about it a little bit more, Meredith, and I will email you. And then if you all want to uh, share that with anybody that asks, that would be awesome. But that's a great question. I love that. Thank you for asking it. Well, thank you. All right. And uh, just a little bit of resources to share from the library. We do have a related post about bringing birds to your yard on our blog, uh, planolibrarylearns.org. We'll drop that link in the chat if you want to check that out. It has a lot of great resources. Um, and we do have, of course, a lot of materials that you can look up in our uh, catalog and check out. So if you have any questions, you can always contact the uh, department and ask questions from Erin and her team. Um, I put the link in the website for the uh, Garden Green in Plano, and we can always drop that in there again. Um, and they have a lot of great resources there as well. And we do have not this Saturday, but next Saturday, if you are a gardener and you're interested, um, that would be a great time to visit us. We have the Garden Green in Plano Fair on Saturday the 24th. That is going to be from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, we're going to be talking about, or we're going to have learning stations all around the uh, uh, site. And there will be things on composting, things on uh, native plants that we have in our garden. 
uh, if you're new to gardening and you're trying to figure out um, what kinds of plants we are having master compost or master gardeners will be there we'll be able to answer master comp uh, master composters will answer composting questions uh, we're going to talk about like how to pick a tool so it's a come and go event you drop in you go around to as many stations as you want yes questions of all our volunteers and our experts and we hope that you will learn a little bit more about how to garden sustainably in Texas. September 24th, 10 a.m. to noon at the Environmental Education Center.